panel discussion with Chika Onigwe, um, Helen Habila, and Namdi Ahirim. Um, and I'll just do some quick introductions in alphabetical order. Um, Namdi Ahirim is a Nigerian writer based in Lagos and Madrid. His work has been frequently published in Afrida and Arts in Africa, and his debut novel, Prince of Monkeys, was published by Counterpoint Press in April 2019. Helen Nabila is a professor of creative writing at George Mason University, Virginia. He was born in Nigeria, where he worked as a journalist before moving to the US. He's the author of four novels, including Waiting for, Waiting for an Angel, Measuring Time, Oil and Water, and Travelers. He edited the Granta book of, Af of the African short story. His book of short fiction, The Chippewa Girls, focuses on the 276 schoolgirls kidnapped by Boko Haram Islamists in northern Nigeria in 2014. Habila is a regular contributor to The Guardian, to the UK Guardian, and a contributing, author, um, contributing editor to the Virginia Quarterly Review. Habila's work has won many awards, including the Kane Prize, the Commonwealth Prize, Africa Region, the Virginia Library Prize for Fiction, and the Wynham Campbell Prize, among many others. <laughs> That's something. Um, Chika Onigwe is the author of, amongst others, On Black Sister Street, translated into many languages, including Spanish, Hebrew, Hungarian, Italian, German, Polish, and Dutch, and Night Dancer. Her latest short story is in New Daughters of Africa. Um, she was a 2016 Bonderman. I know, I know, it's in there, it's in there. The, I think it's a single short story. <laughs> She was a 2016 Bonder Man Assistant professor, professor of Literary Arts at Brown University and is a visiting professor of creative writing at Emory University. Heavily anthologized, she has also written op-eds for the New York Times and the UK Guardian. She has won many awards, including the 2012 LNNG Prize for Literature and the BBC Short Story Award. Her 2016 short story, Happiness um, of Transition Magazine, was awarded a Pushcart Prize Special Mention. Her latest collection of short stories, Better Never Than Late, it's currently out from Cassava Republicans, actually available um, outside today. All right, so let's, move, let's, move, let's get into it. Um, more than half a century ago, 61 years to be exact, Chinua Achebe's first novel, Things Fall Apart, was published. It wasn't the first novel from Engli in English from Nigeria, let alone from the continent and it was published by, and published by Heinemann UK, its London heavy initial audience didn't know what to make of it. For some, as Ruth Franklin has written of its earliest reviews, the novel focused on the mindless time of Achebe's grandfather. For others, grandfathers, for others, it was great ethnography, a unique glimpse into primitive times that could support often Western anthropological inquiries. Obviously, no one thought it was, it was going to be the literary treasure that it would eventually become. 60 years on, have things changed you know, of this novel? Is it still a novel that elicits such disparate, you know, disparate views, such diverse opinions? That's the subject of this panel. What has always been interesting about Things Fall Apart is the question of who owns the novel. Is it the Igbo people? Is it Nigeria? Is it the continent? Or is it the world by which we often really mean the West? Who gets to de determine that it is an important novel? Our panelists today could not be more fitting to engage with these questions. They are young, vibrant, yet also experienced, important writers who by virtue or vice of their occupation constantly engage with these questions. They each also have an interesting relationship with Things Fall Apart that I think, that I think is you know, worth listening to and hearing about. And that's where we should start. So I'll start with Chika, who, in honor of Things Fall Apart, and Chino Achebe wrote an essay in the Massachusetts Review, A Tale of Two Books. And the statement in that essay that really struck me was one where she went, nothing in my experience of literature since has ever had a strong effect on my sense of, on my sense of the sheer possibilities of writing. Can you, can, you expand, can you expand on what it meant to encounter Things Fall Apart and what that means of expanding you know, on the shared possibilities of writing. Yeah, well, um, thank you all for being here, and thank you, Wally, for the um, very gracious introduction. Um, so when I, I wrote that essay um, in the context of what um, confronting or reading things fall apart for the first time um, meant to me. So um, I grew up in a middle-class home a very long time ago, 
which meant that I had access to books, right? But the books I had access to, um, like many people who grew up in middle class Nigerian homes in that time, many years ago, um, were mostly books from the West. So my parents would travel and they would bring back books. And so the African books I read were books by, um, were books that my older siblings had been assigned as reading lists. And uh, many of them didn't like to read, so they would ask me to read and then just give them the summary. I was like, they're spark notes, right? So, so I read everything for them. But also because I enjoyed reading it, people knew I loved reading. And um, so they would give me books, right? So I really loved reading, but I didn't have any literary um, fence. So I wasn't discriminatory in what I read, as long as it was, it was written down. And someone, a social auntie around, this, around that time, before I read Things Fall Apart, came and gave me a book. And she was like, oh, you should read this book. It explains so many things. No wonder Nigeria is the way it is. No wonder the black man is cursed. And so this book was actually a pamphlet, right? Maybe 40 pages. And the thesis of the entire book was, um, it's, it, the, the book said a quote from Genesis, right? And then, but the thesis of the entire book was that God was, that um, when Cain killed Abel, God punished Cain by cursing him with a stain on his body, or his cane, and that that stain was the black, black skin, right? And that that was why, you know, we were cursed, and that, and I was maybe eight years old, right? Yeah. And the only thing I wanted to do at eight years old was go to heaven. <laughs> and, this, and, and, the, and so the book or pamphlet went on to say that, so because, you know, we were cursed, I would never make it to heaven. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is terrible. Like, I'm trying to be good, right? I'm trying to make heaven. And then I can't make it because of something I had no control over. But I also couldn't talk to anybody about it. I was just, I went to bed feeling like really scared and having nightmares and, and stuff, seeing the devil chase me around and all of that. And then I, I can't remember how much, how much long after I read that book that I came to, um, that I read Things Fall Apart. And for the first time I read about colonization, not as, a, um, as an enriching factor, but as a disrupting factor. So I think that came in and disrupted a community that was already there, right? And maybe when I was eight, I couldn't have articulated it that way, but that was, that's the experience I remember, that wow, you know, so this existed, and if this existed, then you know, I'm more than enough, right? And, and, I, and no book has been able to do that for me again, because um, I've already had that experience, sure. right? So that's the, um, the importance of Things Fall Apart for me. It came at a point where, um, I was so convinced that I shouldn't aspire to anything. Sure. I shouldn't aspire to heaven because I was black. Sure. And then, and also, you know, being middle class, I went to a good school, right? So good schools, if you spoke vernacular, if you spoke vernacular, if you spoke yeah. in your local language, you were punished. Um, you were told that, you know, Mongo Park discovered River Niger, that I see people who'd been going there and fetching water there, you know, didn't exist. So, like, nothing existed before colonization. And at your best, things fall apart was like a realization for me, or like a, a, an articulation for me, you know, that we existed, things existed before there was a colonization there, right? And this was just a different type of, of, um, of a disrupting influence on a colonization that was already in existence. Uh, Helen, was that the same? Was that a similar experience for you? Did you did you encounter this novel as a you know growing up or as a child or how, how was your own? Yeah, to be honest, I can't say this is the very first you know time, the first moment when I encountered it, when I read it. Um, so to start with, I didn't study literature sure. in secondary school because I did the sciences. You know, there was a time when yes, they were yes, dividing yes. science students. Yeah, and art students. So I never got to study yeah. um, Things Fall Apart in school. So I read it. I think when I was growing up, there were always books in the house. Yeah. Well, I have older brothers, and they would you know, read their books, and they would drop them basically these tattered copies of books. And I remember the cover of Things Fall Apart, that edition with the you know, folkloric drawing. Um, I can't remember the, 
the name of the person who wrote the introduction or the artist, but you know, that's the volume. But many pages were missing um, at that time. So, um, oh, maybe to go back, I, I shouldn't, maybe I should talk a little bit about Chino Achebe before I even talk about the book itself. Okay. Because I know that I've had the privilege of meeting him in person yes. and working with him. Yes. Um, so let me just say what he means to me before I even begin to talk about the book. Um, so he's the reason why today I'm in America, I'm working in America, because after I won the Cain Prize and I moved to England, and I was living in England, my first book came out, and I was working on my second book. I was, doing, I was starting my PhD in, at the University of East Anglia, and then um, one day the phone rang, and my wife said, Chino Achebe is on the phone for you. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> she said, yeah, Chino Achebe is on the phone for you. So I thought she was you know, kidding me. And there he was on the phone. And he asked me, would you want to come to America to be the first Chino Achebe fellow? I was like, hmm, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, let me think about it. I'll come. So that's, I did the Chino Achebe fellowship for one year, and I got to meet him be in his house, meet his family, hang out with him. And he is, he was, you know, such a very, very nice person. And you can see why the book is so great, you know, because he was a great man, he had a great soul. And so that's really my encounter with him. So there's, there's the book, now to come back to the book itself. I encountered it when I was kind of aspiring to become a writer. So there was that first moment when I first read it in bits and pieces, I didn't really breathe from beginning to end. Then later, when I was at university and I wanted to be a writer, I reread it. And by then, of course, I had read you know, all the post-colonial. Sure. I was aware of the politics around the book. So you could say that now I could read the book and understand its context, um, not just for reading it for pleasure, but to understand its full import and what it means in African literature. So there I was, reading not just the book, but the essays around it. And Chino Achebe saying why he wrote the book, because of, of course, Heart of Darkness, um, Joyce Carries, Mr. Johnson. He wanted, to, he wanted to show that Africa wasn't like the colonialists um, portray it. It's different. It's, it's such a heavy thing, yeah. you know, for a writer to discover that. That's it, you know, that's, that's, that's one way of looking at literature. But to be honest, I wasn't looking for that kind of model itself, yes. you know? I wanted a different kind of writing because writing is always decided by the milieu in which you are writing, in which you grow up, in which you live. So I was living in the 1990s, trying to be a writer, and um, the things that concerned me at that time were the pro-democracy movement. This was a decade when Kensar Riwa was killed, when Deligua was killed, and for me, things fall apart was something that, you know, in the distance, in the past, in the distant past. I was looking for a different kind of model, and I couldn't find any. Um, because the book was so successful, basically all the writers writing around that time were basically imitating Things Fall Apart. And I think you've, you've, you've written about that before, you know, about yeah, how yeah. T.S. Eliot warns against this exactly. archaeological reconstruction, yeah. and we should look towards more yeah. of thinking about Things Fall Apart as part of a tradition. Right. Correct. So, Correct. I think yeah. That, yeah. So there I was looking for a model, and there's this weight of this book that you feel as if you have to. But I didn't want to write a book set in the village, for instance. Of course. Yes. I didn't want a book that people would be talking in proverbs, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> All that wasn't relevant to me, you know? <laughs> so then eventually I discovered Dambuzo Marachera. Stylistically, this was what I wanted to do. You know, the modernist kind of. Um, non-linear, non, non non-traditional, um, fragmented kind of narrative. And Dambuzo Maritara did that for me. It was until much later when I was writing my second book that I actually went back to the Chino Achebe model. And, but it shows that you can't escape things fall apart. You eventually have to come back to it. Sure. But at that moment, that wasn't what I was looking for. So there's this kind of love-hate relationship you know, with the book. You can't escape it, but it also determines what you do. Um, even as you try to escape it, you are actually in dialogue with it. Sure. So I see our writing has always been in dialogue with Things Fall Apart because it's, it's such an important book. You can never write, this, this, Things Fall Apart, 
and there's everything else that comes after things fall apart. So, yeah. so I want to ask Namdi this specifically because you know you've you've published you know your first novel and you wrote this really really interesting essay on you know how a new generation of writers is reclaiming you know um, tradition I guess from um, well it's reclaiming tradition I guess and one thing that struck me about the essay was you know this idea of you know, the relevance of things fall apart in all of this. And it's not necessarily, you know, like um, Helen has said, you know, it's not necessarily trying to imitate what, you know, things fall apart was about. But in this essay, you kind of identify that a new generation of writers, you know, are innovating about how they, you know, what they do with traditional settings, what they do with cosmology, specifically things like, you know, the Igbo or the Nani and things like that. And I wanted to kind of ask you, what about your, you know, what about your introduction to things fall apart, do you think, or what about our generation's introduction to things fall apart, do you think, gives us this license to be very innovative with how we approach, um, often very traditional, because tradition can be restrictive, but what your essay was arguing is that people are breaking out of these molds and really thinking about new ways of thinking of presenting tradition. When you look at, for example, you know, um, Akweke's, Akweke Mezi's Freshwater and how, you know, the novel really reimagines, you know, what it means to be an Ogbanje in a way that it's not even reimagining, but, a, but almost a revelation of what it is. So what do you think it is about our, our introduction to Things Fall Apart and these really grand novels. Is it the distance that we have over time or, 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 or just even distance in terms of ge you know, geography, being able to you know, be flexible and almost even disruptive with how we think about these novels? So firstly, from how I got into Things Fall Apart, like Helen, um, I was also a science student yeah. and I studied science stuff, right? And I didn't, <laughs> exactly, right? That's what he told us. So that informed the decision to study in the science class. And I still read things for the part in secondary school, but it was also at the time where my friend in art class were studying things for the part. So like he did, I picked up a copy and I read it. But the thing was, um, in my coming across things for the part, I feel firstly, the, the most people from previous generations who encountered things fall apart um, came at it from two different ways, right? Firstly, they had misread Africa, and um, things fall apart was them rereading Africa, and they could see themselves in the mirror properly. Mm -hmm. And there was also the legacy of it, right, of reading um, African literature around that time for the first time. For me, I read things for the part after I had read Purple Hibiscus and after I read certain books, right? So I'd already had my seen myself in the mirror moment. And even from his generation, I had read Sipri and the Quincy prior to him, I'd read Butchie and Mecheta. So I also had experienced writers of that time. So when I was reading Achebe, it was stripped of the luggage of his legacy. It was just another book, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I appreciated it as just another book. And yes, I had heard the things about how Things Fall Apart was the greatest um, book in African literature and how it was the most seminal work. And reading it as just another story, I didn't, I didn't see any of that. Yeah, because right? you didn't have that context. Exactly. Right? I didn't see how he was um, incredibly world beyond um, Emecheta and Equencia and Elitia Amadi, right? <laughs> so, but then again, I would say, um, much later, rereading, especially his non-fiction, the education of a British, British protected child, where he discusses his influences as well, and just reading other things later in life, reading what everybody read before things fall apart, the misreadings of Africa yes, things yes, for, yes. Um, before things fall apart. I then could appreciate where he was coming from and what he stood for, and also just in terms of, I feel as writers. It's very rare that people create in isolation. So it's always a collaborative effort, directly or indirectly. It could be the, um, an offshoot of workshopping, of sharing it with readers, conversations with other readers and writers, reading what your peers are doing. And I think in the discussion around Achebe and Things Fall Apart, 
we don't really, in, in a lot of the conversations, it's not taken into consideration that he didn't write this in isolation because he came from government college in Umar here, went to university college in Ibadan. Sure. And these are institutions where they had great thinkers and writers. A Quincy had published before him and was his peer in the university. And he also had, at some point, there was Shane Kadia and Okik and there were also great intellectuals of that era there. And even when he, in further essays, when he discusses Mr. Johnson and the Heart of Darkness, he references conversations he had in class with these people, right? So when you see things fall apart, you can see it as a product of a generation's thinking yeah. and not just his individual opinion. And also reading beyond things fall apart, reading about that, that generation, yes, he edited the African Writer series and obviously his imprint on the, his... Um, his stamp on the work that came off would bear similarities, would have his own fingerprint on it, right? That's why we would read other writers and be like, this is Achebe-esque, right? And everybody from this generation is copying the mode. Well, not really, because they made this mode together, is how I like to look at it. And going forward mm. from my generation, right, rewriting um, African tradition and African ontology in uh, contemporary literature, we have the privilege that a lot of people didn't have. We had the privilege of not just consuming the work, but consuming the legacy around the work. Sure. So we understand how it came about. It's easier to replicate even in, the, even in the modern day. And I think that's what a lot of people try to do. So we are not necessarily trying to rewrite things for apart, but we are looking at the way, the thought process behind the way it came about, the sure. things that were considered when it came about, and we're pretty much replicating these things. So something that I want to kind of open up to, you know, to the panel is this idea of, you know, who owns things fall apart. You know, why is this an important novel? And I've, you know, we've we've talked about this, you know, behind the scenes and kind of just like, you know, I guess a rift, uh, rift on it. But it's this idea that, you know, you have this really important novel, and I guess for someone like me who is you know, in their 20s, really trying to figure out why this novel became what it is. I'm wondering, you know, is it because, is this novel important because it's important to evil people? Is it important because it's important to Nigerians who don't necessarily have, who don't necessarily talk about it all the time? Or is it important because it's important to, you know, like I said, the world? And oftentimes when we say the world, what we mean is, you know, the West. Is it important because it's important to the Western establishment? And I want to kind of get, you know, some thoughts on this. You know, why is this novel important? Is it one of those things that has got into that cycle of publishing where, you know, we, we, we get the feedback from the world? Or is it something whose importance is rooted here and still rooted here? Uh, yeah, um, I think it's important because it's, it's, it's canonical because it's important, let yes. me put it that way. And it's important because of um, when it was published, sure. right? It's important because of what, I mean, it, it came out in 19, 1958. 1958, right? So 1958, Nigeria was still a colony, yeah. right? And, and then you have this book, which is, you know, really tearing, tearing the whole issue of, of colonization apart. Yeah. So it's important for that reason too. Right? And it's important because, you know, really, I, I think that no, no matter what you write, if it's not a good book, right, um, it's not going to stand the test of time. Sure. And, um, and of course, we can't um, discount the, um, the importance, too, of, you know, who did the reviewing, who were the critics, what they were saying about it. Because very often we take what we, we take what's important when we decide that something is important, depending on who's telling us that it's that important. important yes, right? exactly. If you've been told this is, it's important for you to read this, right? And it's coming from the New York Times, and it's coming from the Garden, and it's coming from wherever else, we tend to take that more seriously, right? But I think that all those are incidental, yeah. right? I think that things fall apart is important because it dared to say what it did yes. at a time when Nigeria was still a colony, yes. right? And it was published in the West at a time when the West didn't want to hear the, the sort of thing that he was saying. In African countries, we were agitating for independence at that time, right? And sort of go back to the, to, to go back to the colony, you know, to go back to the colonial master yeah. and say, you know, you guys are, you know, 
you guys just disrupted, disrupted a, a civilization that was there. Why did you come, right? Um, it's a very powerful thing to do. I wasn't, like, I mean, it's, it's very easy for a much younger generation yes. not to understand that, right? That what he was doing was radical. He was being very radical, right? Um, before Achebe, Amos Tutu Allah had published. But Amos Tutu Allah's works didn't question the idea of colony in the way that things fall apart sure. did. And I think therein lies its, its, its importance. Mm -hmm. The fact that he dared to question the colony and to question the power in, and the power dynamics at the time that sure. it did so. Sure. People questioning it now, right? It doesn't have quite have the same impact because it's already been done. We've gone somewhat beyond that, right? Um, and, and so I think it's, it's, it's very important to sort of remember when it was written, what sure. was going on, sure. you know, in Nigeria. No, and I think you raised, yeah, you Nigeria. definitely raised some really interesting points because, you know, as you were speaking, what just like, you know, what I'm reminded of is that, you know, Zadie Smith says something, which is that progress is never permanent. Mm -hmm. You know, it must be reimagined. And yeah. what I think about Things Fall Apart is, if you speak to, you know, there's a sect of Nigerians, and probably, if it might be jokes, it might not be jokes, you know, who have this idea that our country isn't working, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the British should have never left, that kind of thing. I don't know if you've heard that before. Or, you know, we should have been colonized longer, or we should be recolonized. And people say these things because people don't necessarily understand what it means to be, you know, a colony or what it means to be a colonized subject. And I think that novels like this kind of really expose that, you know, and are still relevant for that reason, um, yeah. specifically. But I don't know if you wanted to I'm add. Sorry, yeah. and I think yeah. that also, I mean, in terms of, um, of pushing African literature sure. forward or propelling it, Things Fall Apart is also, is also, you know, at the forefront of it. You know, when Achebe became um, editor of, he of Heidemann Africa, he published, I don't know, 20, 30, how many books? More than that. A lot, he, yeah. yeah, a lot. He published um, Ngugi. He published, you sure. know, all the names that are now, you know, known as the fathers of African literature. Sure. You know, Ach Achebe was instrumental in, in publishing Flora Mwapa, you know, and I think that if he hadn't published when he did, right, the situation might have been difficult, but have been different. And because Heinemann Africa existed when it did, we're able to sit down here now as writers, sure. right? So. Um, yeah, um, to, um, to add to that, it, I mean, it's important for all these reasons mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Um, and also, it's very rare, you know, f to have a book that defines a whole generation, mm -hmm. the whole period, um, not just in Nigeria, but all over Africa. Sure. And it came at a time when you had the um, Pan-African movement and the, the nationalist African movement. And in essence, it became like their anthem. You know, this is one book that you can take and say, this is it. I don't even need to say anything to you, just read this book. It says everything. There's an essay, I think, by Simon Gikandi. Um, it's called Chino Achebe and the Invention of African sure. Culture, something like that. He said, as far as he's concerned, that Chino Achebe invented African culture. Um, not that he invented African culture, I but in the sense that he put <laughs> it inside a book. And sometimes, because we're in this, um, kind of space where for anything to have worth or to be taken seriously, you need to code it, you need to write it in a book. And to be able to take it and travel with it and put it in a library for people to read. Sure. So Achebe did all that. And it's also very hard to find a book that takes into cognizance and practicalizes all the theoretical aspects, um, the politics of that time. So there was the politics of language, for instance. People yes. were asking, should we write in English language? Should we write in European languages? Achebe didn't only um, suggest that this is what we should do. He actually did it. So when you, when you look at things fall apart, even though it's in English, it's not just any kind of English. It's an African English, yes. you know? It's Igbo yes. English. It's Igbo English, English yeah. you know? <laughs> it's Nigerian English. <laughs> so he did all that. So it's almost as if he is putting down the blueprint for other writers. This is. This is the way to go, this is the way to go. And people sometimes refer to him, even though he's, he, he was the first one to always say that, I'm not the father of African literature, you know? But that's why people always go back to him and say that he's the father of African literature because he did all this since he showed you how you can marry these two traditions. Um, the conflicting, you know, sure. two sure. spaces of tradition and modernity, he says, you know, they don't have to be in conflict. Yeah. You can actually harmonize them and create this text that takes both aspects and put it inside one book. 
So he did all sure. these things. I think that's what did you want to add? Yeah. Did you want yeah, to add something? It's it's pretty much like most of what they've said, but it's also um, emphasizing on the fact that yes, a lot of I mean to answer your question directly, right? Saying does it belong to the West or to us in Nigeria slash Africa? I think it's both because I would say regardless of. Um, the impact they had in the West, a Nigerian slash African reading things fell apart at that time, would still have seen himself in the mirror and it would still have had the same impact. It would still have inspired him to do things with culture and with language. And for the Western reader, if it was published exclusively in the West and he never made his way to Nigeria, it would still have the effect it had on them because it showed them a new picture of Africa and what can be done um, from the continent about the continent. So I feel those two legacies are just as valid and are just as important. Um, and yes, it did a lot in breaking the stereotype of what was written about Africa, but to an extent as well, it also became a stereotype of what could come out from Africa. Because um, we've spoken about this, right, with the African series about how everything was of a similar mode, but even going forward up until very recently, what was considered a serious African literature still had to follow a certain mode of being um, very, in a way, pro-nationalism or culture or very serious issues. Because like you rightly said, Tusola wrote in that same era. And Yes, it's an important book, but it really wasn't has it, was, it really wasn't taken as seriously at the time. And even Cyprian Quincy, who published before him, who published a book which wasn't as woke as we would say nowadays, which is about city people just living and chilling, also didn't have the same cultural impact it had just because of what he chose and chose what he chose to explore and what he chose not to explore. And in many ways, it became a stereotype, and even. For, I mean, we are Nigerians, so we can own it and speak about it, but for the vast rest of the continent, they also had things fall apart put on them as what was their African literature and what represented them as well, even though it still had stark differences to what they had and what they experienced. Whether it be it's Anglophone Africa or Francophone Africa or everything, things fall apart was the book imposed on everybody as your traditional literature. So before I open it up to um, you know the audience for questions, I wanted to just um, ask one final, you know, just get one final thought. And I think this is more, anyone can answer, but um, so, you know, V.Y. Mudimbe, the philosopher, speaks of this idea that we're constantly, you know, inventing Africa, or, uh, or you can think of Africa as an invention. And, you know, it really came to mind when you were talking about Simon Gikandi's essay. And for me, one of the things that I find interesting is that, you know, 60 years, you know, 60 years after things fall apart, which is, I guess, the landmark African novel, can we still speak of African literature is Africa still a reliable um, you know a reliable label that you can use to categorize literature from you know from from the continent um, and the reason I ask this is because you know from our discussion we are publishing nowadays you know diverse um, a diversity of writing I mean from writing that occurs online flash fiction all